Hello and welcome back to a new session from the teaching series entitled The Glory of Righteousness. Today we're going to talk about the purpose and the effects of conscience. In Romans 1, 18 to 20, we are shown that every person has a conscience. It's impossible for you not to have a conscience. Let read, let's read this passage together. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, not to them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, not vague, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Some people believe that there are human beings that don't have a conscience, don't have any conviction over sin, and that it's only religion that imposes this knowledge of right and wrong upon people. Some say that all things would be so much better if there were, weren't any religious people telling everybody what is right and what is wrong. However, this passage that we just read indicates that this knowledge is placed by God in everybody. It's like a homing device telling you exactly and constantly that you are failing. Even though this is a painful and none of us like it, it's necessary for us. In order to receive salvation, you must be first aware of your need for salvation. A question might arise here in some people's minds concerning Jesus and the conscience. Since Adam received the conscience after he sinned and Jesus was born without sin, did Jesus have a conscience? Did he need one since he never sinned? Of course he had a conscience. First, he had a conscience because he had to retain all the attributes of humanity except the sin nature. He had to be a man in all aspects so that his sacrifice would be meaningful and that humanity would be able to identify with him in his death as a payment for its sins. Second, having a conscience does not make one sinful. The conscience is holy because it reflects God's nature and moral standard. Jesus had a conscience because he was human, but he never violated it. The inquiring minds might go further now with questions, and this is a very good thing. I always encourage questions from the Word of God. And the next possible question is this. Since Jesus had a conscience and he was also God, doesn't that mean that God the Father or the Holy Spirit had a conscience too? After all, Genesis 3.22 shows us that the whole Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had the knowledge of good and evil. In that passage, God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. If God the Father knew good and evil, doesn't that mean that he had a conscience too? And I'm ending the question here. Well, not really. Ask yourself this question. Does God the Father really need a conscience? I believe that he has never had a conscience, and that is why he didn't create men with a conscience in the first place. At this point, you might really get alarmed and say something like, what? Isn't that heresy? Well, I encourage you to be calm for a moment and think a little deeper about this together with me. God is righteous. He exists in righteousness. And his very nature is righteousness. He does not, he does not have a moral compass that governs him. By his very nature, God is right all the time. Everything that God says and does is right and just. The concept of good and evil is so deeply ingrained in us as human beings that it is difficult to understand a perspective where, God, uh, where good and evil do not exist. It is a human perspective to see God as the ultimate symbol of moral goodness. However, God is much more than that. He is righteousness. There's a difference between the two and I'll explain why. For instance, if you see God as simply moral, then his laws are open for moral debate. Moral standards change over time. What is immoral for one culture is acceptable in another. You can debate morality forever and never come to a point of agreement. 
And this is particularly evident in the issue of same-sex marriage that we experience today. God defined marriage only between a man and a woman. It is not open for discussion, but people have made it a moral and ethical argument. How can two people who love each other not be allowed to marry? Who cares that they are same-sex gender? Although I understand the logic behind this argument, it doesn't matter. Because God's law is not ethical or moral. It is righteous. Therefore, God is right and there's no discussion. Simply the fact that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, was that an immoral thing? No, not at all, according to moral standards, right? What is so bad in eating the fruit of a tree? However, it was a capital sin and something immoral because God said so. Was something immoral uh, the, the fact that Moses hit the rock uh, the second time instead of speaking to it? No. Again, it wasn't a sinful thing in itself. However, it was a serious sin for which Moses was harshly punished by God because God had told him to speak to the rock and not hit it. Do you see the difference between a moral compass and righteousness? Now let's try to define evil based on what we've said so far. Because God is righteous, there are only two possible responses from humans to what God says. Obey God and live, rebel against God and die. Anything that leads to death, distress, and judgment is what the Bible defines as evil. Evil is not an objective entity that is opposite to God. Evil is anything that leads to death, distress, or judgment. Because it's rebellion against God. For man, this is a matter of moral choice. Obey God, which is good, and live. Reject God, which is evil, and die. However, for God, it's a matter of truth. God said the wages of sin is death. Thus, when you sin, you will surely die. God knows good and evil not through a conscience and never because he experienced evil himself, but because evil is anything that God isn't and he knows himself. Evil is everything contrary to God's nature and to his decrees that are truth. As I mentioned briefly in the previous session, when man ate from the forbidden tree, two things happened. First, man's spirit died and became separated from God's righteousness. And second, he received the conscience to distinguish between good and evil. Man's spirit didn't die because of the fruit in itself in the sense that the fruit imparted death to him. Man died simply because he disobeyed God's command to not eat from that tree. When man violated God's command, he became evil and knew evil just because he came against the righteous command that God had given him. If the tree of knowledge of good and evil had imparted death and evil to man, then it should have been called the tree of, the tree of death maybe or the tree of evil. After all, the, the other important tree was called the tree of life, right? Because it would have imparted eternal life to Adam's body. However, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil imparted something to man, the conscience. Think about this for a moment. This is so amazing. God is so smart. When God gave the man the command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God actually gave man the option to rebel against him and become evil so that man would have freedom of choice. However, on, in the same time, God embedded the conscience in the very fruit of the forbidden tree. Conscience is the ability to distinguish between good and evil. It is a footprint, if I may say so, of God's righteousness, which reveals a little bit of God's own nature. And man needed the conscience so that he would know immediately that he rebelled against God and realized the magnitude of his sinful act. Otherwise, he would have moved maybe on with his life and would have never realized what he did. Uh, moreover, the conscience was going to keep in check the dead spirit of man until the full righteousness of Christ would come. That is why man didn't become pure evil like the devil who also rebelled against God and was unredeemable. This whole strategy in itself reveals something extraordinary about God. It reveals that he prepared for the very possibility of man disobeying him by placing a conscience in the fruit of that tree instead of death. God could have created the tree of life and the tree of death. 
And when man would have eaten from the tree of death, that would have been his end. Man would have entered eternal death forever and become like the devil unredeemable, while God would have let man reign, remain in death and create maybe another world. That would have been righteous for God and nobody could have blamed him for it. After all, he told man that the day he would eat from that tree, he would die. However, here we see God's extravagant love for us and his magnificent wisdom. Praise him. Praise the Lord for that. Now let's come back to the purpose and the effects of conscience that we are talking about. Your conscience is the part of you that condemns you. Yes, it is true that there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 tells us that. But we have to believe that verse in order to get rid of the condemnation that comes from our conscience. We have to take the word of God and purge our conscience with it, cleanse our conscience and wash it with the water of the word. There are two ways to cleanse our conscience. Let's read first Hebrews 9.14 and Hebrews 10.22 where it says this. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. And Hebrews 10, 22, Let's draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. As these passages illustrate, one way to cleanse our conscience is to apply the blood of Christ on, on the sinful things that our conscience condemns us of and to declare the truth of the word of God about us, about our identity, even in the middle of, of those condemning feelings. Another more efficient way to cleanse our conscience is to not violate it in the first place. 1 Timothy 1.19 says that we make our faith shipwreck if we don't keep a good conscience. Let's read this passage. Having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. The same thing is found in 1 Timothy 3.9. Let's read this passage also. Holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. We see in these passages the contrast between a good, pure conscience and an evil, defiled conscience. A good and pure conscience is one that hasn't been violated, while an evil and defiled conscience is one that has been transgressed by something wrong that we did, and now that conscience is condemning us. And as much as we can, we should not violate our conscience, because that affects our faith in a negative way. It destroys our faith even in other things from the Word of God and in other areas of ministry and life. It will be more difficult, for, for instance, for us to pray for a sick person to be healed when we have an evil conscience that condemns us. We can cleanse that conscience by using what the Word of God says about us, about our identity. But it's even better when we keep a pure conscience on a regular basis without violating it. 1 John 3.21 says this, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. Confidence and keeping your confidence strong towards God is very important in exercising faith in any area of your life. Hebrews 10.35 says this, Therefore, don't cast away your confidence, which has great reward. This is one of the reasons why many people in the body of Christ don't see greater manifestations of the power of God. It is because their own heart, their conscience is condemning them. It is because they constantly are violating what God told them to do or not to do. Romans 2.15 describes the function of the conscience this way. Let's read this passage together as well. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, uh, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. The conscience is the part of you that either accuses you or excuses you. The part that either condemns you or gives you confidence. Your conscience can actually build you up or it can tear you down. Depending whether it's a good conscience or an evil conscience. And many people don't understand this and don't know how to deal with their conscience in a proper way 
so that they will be continually built up in faith and ready for every good work. Now, another important thing about conscience that we want to talk today is that the conscience is not a perfect guide and you cannot depend only on it, especially as a new creation in Christ. The conscience can be influenced. It can be seared, 1 Timothy 4.2. It can be defiled. It can be skewed. It can be weak, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 7, or strong. And it can be good or evil. Let's see a few examples. One it comes from 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 to 9. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things and we for him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we don't eat are we the worse. But be aware, beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. From what we see in this passage, a weak conscience seems to be one that has less knowledge and revelation of the reality of the word of God. And as a result has more rules imposed to it than necessary. This passage also shows us again that a conscience can be defiled by infringing one of those rules that it has. A conscience is not defiled only with bad, immoral things, but also with things that go beyond our self-imposed limits and rules that are based ultimately on our level of knowledge and revelation. This passage that we just read described an issue existing in the first century church. Many people in that time had been idol worshippers before becoming Christians and had trouble with meat purchased from the markets that had been offered unto idols. Some of those idol worshippers would feel condemned and say something like that. Well, for me to eat this meat that has been sacrificed to an idol means that I would also participate in that idol worship. However, other people understood the grace of God in a deeper way and would think differently. They would say something like, that idol is nothing for me. The meat is not defiled and nothing will happen if I go ahead and buy and eat the meat that had been sacrificed and offered to idols. It was probably cheaper as well, so it was more convenient. Romans 14 verses 20 to 23 describes a similar instance. Let's read this passage together as well. Don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for the man who eats with offense. It's good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it for yourself before, your, before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. What we learn from this illustration is that human conscience can make one feel guilty about things that, uh, that there is nothing wrong with. I was once in a vacation with my family to the beach, and while we were there, we went to a local church on a Sunday morning, and the pastor there started to preach that Christians should not drink coffee or go to the beach. And here we were all tanned from the sun and enjoying our lives. And of course, as you can imagine, everyone's eyes were on us while these, this was going on. Not to mention that they were all living near the beach. Imagine that, to live near the beach and never use it. What I'm trying to say is that your conscience can change depending on your background, your upbringing, and on different other things. Of course, every person is born on this earth with a basic conscience and a core intuitive knowledge of good and evil that God has placed there. However, that basic conscience can be either expanded to become super sensitive by adding more rules to it, or it can also be shrunk to a dull and insensitive conscience that no longer works properly. 
And to understand better how the conscience works, we can compare it to a monitoring application. In my line of work in the IT world, we have different monitoring applications that monitor databases and the resources from the company's computers. For instance, they can monitor the space usage on storage, uh, processor usage, the CPU usage, the, uh, the occurrence of different uh, errors or corruptions. And whenever such an event occurs or a predefined threshold is crossed, an email alert notification is sent to my phone and then I can intervene and check what the problem is. These monitors come with a predefined set of alerts that are most important and basic. From there, you can delete some of those predefined basic alerts, modify their thresholds, or you can add more alerts and thresholds. But any monitoring system needs to have its alerts tuned so that the system is not overly sensitive, but neither too loose. On one hand, if the monitoring system is overly sensitive, you will receive email alerts all the time. Your inbox will be flooded and you might miss some critical alerts. On the other hand, if the monitoring system is too loose, then you'll receive less alerts or not at all. In this case, you have a higher chance of not being alerted when a real critical issue occurs. The human conscience functions in the exact same way. It comes with a predefined set of basic moral guidelines on and which on one hand we can, we can make that conscience more sensitive by imposing new rules to our minds consciously or unconsciously. And depending on the culture or type of church in which we grew up, some new human-made rules might have been passed down to us without us even being aware of them. Those rules might not be necessarily bad, but the downside of a hypersensitive conscience is more condemnation and guilt. On the other hand, we can make that conscience dull by constantly violating it. The downside again of this state is that we slowly lose the ability of seeing as evil some things, deeds, or behaviors that are actually evil or immoral. Now let's move a step further and see another important fact about the conscience that we want to tackle today. We can also skew our conscience by comparing ourselves with others. And 2 Corinthians 10, 12 tells us about this. Let's read this passage together again. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. What this is talking about is that you can skew the judgment of your conscience by just comparing yourself with other people. And this is how many people arrive at their standard of right and wrong. We have an intuitive knowledge of right and wrong, but the scripture did say that we can defile it, we can make it dull, which makes it an unreliable guide. And as I said, many people establish their standard of morality by just looking around and taking the average of morality of those around them in such a way that they are not the worst nor the best. And as long as they come close to the average, most people consider that to be sufficient. Watching movies or shows that contain immorality and adultery in them affects our standard of right and wrong in a negative way. And this is exactly what Hollywood is trying to accomplish lately in a more intensive way by squeezing in every new movie a scene of, uh, involving homosexuality, which most of the time has nothing to do with the plot of the movie. It's there with only one purpose, to skew and accustom people's standard of morality in that area to make their conscience dull to it and to bring those behaviors to a level of normality uh, and of average morality. The conscience cannot be our absolute guide, especially as new creation in Christ. We cannot ignore it either because we all have it. If you ignore it just because it's not a reliable guide, that is to your detriment too because then it becomes dull and hardened. However, we cannot let it reign in our lives and have the final word either. So how do we deal with it? We have to deal with it in a proper way as believers in Christ so that we don't ignore it, neither let it dominate us, but use it to our advantage. The Apostle Paul says the following about his conscience in Acts 23 verse 1 and Acts 24 verse 16. It says this, Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And Acts 24 verse 16. 
This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. God gave us a conscience so that there would be an awareness on the inside of us of the right and wrong, and that it would show us our need for Him. It would bring us to our knees and make us call out to God for help, for salvation. However, as we have seen, our conscience can be corrupted and defiled and when we compare ourselves with each other. So how do we deal with this? Well, we'll see together in the following sessions. And in our next session, we'll continue to talk about the conscience in relation to the law of Moses. But until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you in His perfect peace. Amen.